Commander-in-Chief comes aboard. There are many pages in the story leading up to his Far East command. 30 years service led up to it. Cadet 1913, Midshipman 1916, that's how the story begins. He served in the QE and he served in submarines and how they've advanced since his day of the K-Class. In Renan, destined to survive as Britain's only battle cruiser. In Repulse, fated to be sunk off Malaya. In Revenge, he was a lieutenant then in 1923. In Warspite and QE again as the system fleet wireless officer, Mediterranean fleet. The story of service is of necessity incomplete but later it became profoundly involved in destroyers. It was in destroyers, in the fateful resumption of the World War, that the work of the future CNC was first fully revealed. And never has the work of the destroyer people been so comprehensive, so daring, or so hard as in this war. Before the war, at the King's reviews of the fleet, Commander Lord Louis Mountbatten was in attendance. Newsreel pictures taken at the time seemed to have laid stress on family ties rather than naval affairs, but that was natural enough, for peace, however uneasy, was still preserved. Lord Louis was very interested in films, especially in films for the Navy. He was a guest at a British movie tone commemoration dinner in London. The influence of films was already making headway in the Navy. They could perform a useful service. As entertainment alone, their potential distribution was more than complementary to the more traditional naval show aboard ship. The film, in fact, has preserved these extracts from a typical ship's concert. Since last I see thee. impact of war found Captain Lord Louis in destroyers. The disabling of Kelly and the bringing home of Kelly became one of the most often read stories of the war at sea. Taken in tow, almost continuously bombed throughout the days of her slow and hazardous voyage home, Kelly, like Javelin on another such occasion, nevertheless was brought in. The story is already history, and as the Navy says, deeds count, not words. <laughs> Kelly reached port something of a wreck, but restored to her original beauty and her original fighting efficiency, she fought again. And off Crete, where naval losses exceeded even those of the army, she went down. Interlude in the tempest of war, accompanied by his wife, the future CNC went to the palace to receive the DSO. His next command was illustrious. This great aircraft carrier, which had been bombed in the Mediterranean, had later gone to an American port for repairs, and now Lord Louis was to take command.
great command, that of such a ship as illustrious, but here the thread of the story was broken, for an even more important task intervened. The new Commander-in-Chief Combined Operations comes aboard. A personal inspection of commando troops just before they sailed on one of those earlier raids in northern waters among the fjords and islands of the Norwegian coast. Combined Operations Chief, logically enough, held commissions in the other services as well as in the senior service. And on a visit of inspection to Sandhurst, he saw magnificent material for future operations. Present! Point. Addressing the parade, he spoke almost like a general. Well, as it's less than a year since I got my own commission in the army, I will refrain from giving them any military advice. If I might say one word about combined operations, if any of you go out and buy a sixpenny atlas and look at a map of the world, you will find that after we have cleared the Axis forces out of Tunisia, there is nowhere else that any of us soldiers can go and fight unless we're taken there by a seaborne expedition, unless, in fact, we carry out a combined operation of the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. No prospect whatever exists of military fighting in this war. And we cannot possibly win this war just by bombing or just by blockade, the war can only be won when the soldiers have got in, eventually among the enemy, and have taken physical possession. Already, the war had changed its character from the defensive to the offensive. Alamein was history. North Africa was ours. The Casablanca conference followed. Lord Louis was one of those who planned at Casablanca the next moves in the elimination of Italy and the breaching of the fortress of Europe in the south. Back in Britain, training for the next move was in full swing and the combined operations chief went with military leaders and political heads to witness a weapons display in which the Royal Air Force played a prominent part. Once again, the story took a dramatic turn. Lord Louis took part in that supremely important Anglo-American conference at Quebec. Here, world strategy against the Axis in Europe and their partners in crime of the Far East was worked out. Emphasis was laid on the war against Japan. Lord Louis was chosen to assume the high responsibility of the Southeast Asia Command. It was a command that was complementary to General MacArthur's in the Southwest Pacific. The command, the aim of which was of course precisely the same as that of MacArthur, to smash the Jap. Lord Louis flew to Washington and immediately set forth this aim to the first microphone placed before him at the same time underlining Anglo-American cooperation. I feel very honored to have been appointed to, to the Southeast Asia Command. As you know, it is an allied command, and I am particularly proud to think that there will be United States forces and British forces fighting side by side in the Southeast Asia Command with our Chinese allies until we've finally thrown the Japs out and final victory is won. Once more, the Commander-in-Chief had come aboard. Not a ship this time, but something much greater, something that combined ships and aircraft and armies. A life spent in devoted and distinguished service to his country had led up to this climax of his career. It's certain that his own original service, the Royal Navy, is second to none in wishing him Godspeed in his great task.